This is lesson one for module four, how we generate electrical power. The contents of this lesson, the Leyden jar and capacitors, Leyden jar and capacitors, batteries, Lenz law and induction, DC and AC generators, the AC sine wave, the frequency of AC, also it's important to understand with wind power how to change alternating current to DC and also changing DC to AC as well as storage. The Leyden jar and capacitors. Static electricity can be observed by anyone in a dry surrounding like sliding your stocking feet across carpet on a dry day and zapping someone. An increasing interest in static electricity came about in the 17th century. In the following century, with the introduction of the Leyden jar in 1745, practical observations and experimentation with static charges began. The Leyden jar was a very simple form of what is now a capacitor. The capacitor charges up to the source voltage. In other words, if there's a 9 volt battery, here's the symbol for a battery, the capacitor will charge up to 9 volts. Once charged, it can be removed from the circuit and it will retain its charge and potential indefinitely. This makes some caps very dangerous, especially high voltage, high capacitance types. The capacitor basically consists of two plates, very, very close to one another. These two plates have leads protruding out from the device, which is normally in a particular type of case, aluminum or some other type of coating. The capacitor works by utilizing the force of attraction between the negative terminal of the battery and the positive terminal of the battery. The excess electrons build up on the surface of this plate because they are attracted to the positively charged plate. Once it's removed from the battery, the current flow ceases and the electrons that are towards the surface of this plate remain there. The area of the plate helps to intensify this effect, so the larger the plate area and also the closer together they are, the greater amount of charge the capacitor will hold. The unit of capacitance is the farad. You'll find capacitors with a peak voltage rating and also its capacitance in farads. Batteries utilize chemical reactions to produce a charge. Here's an example of an acid battery using sulfuric acid. There are two lead bars in this single cell battery. The reaction is shown below. An alternative to electrochemical sources is the generator. The generator was created by the understanding of electromagnetic induction where a flow of electrons or current will be induced in the wire when the permanent magnet passes by. Also the faster the magnet moves by the coil, the closer it is to the coil, and the greater the length of the coil concentrated in a small area, the greater the electron current. No electrons are actually jumping from the magnet into the coil. Rather the electrons that are already in the coil and within the wire are being coerced by this changing magnetic field. DC and AC generators. Please watch the first 13 minutes of this video pertaining to electromagnetic induction, induced EMF, and DC and AC generators. It is a fairly old video, <laughs> but it explains it best. It is necessary to understand this concept So having watched the video on AC and DC generators, with an AC generator, as the coil is flat within the field and it is not cutting any magnetic field lines that are going from north to south, no voltage or current flow 
would be produced. As the coil rotates counterclockwise in this vertical position, it begins to cut the field lines and it reaches a maximum when it is parallel, that is 90 degrees from its initial position. As it turns another 90 degrees, which is exactly the opposite from zero, it is again producing no voltage. Once it turns an additional 90 degrees, it is now at 270 degrees, or three-fourths of a full rotation, and it is now producing peak voltage with the opposite polarity. The I indicates the direction of current if a load was connected between these two terminals, such as a light bulb. After an additional 90 degrees, it is at its original position and has made one full revolution. It is also producing no voltage. If this coil is spun in this fashion quickly, this sine wave will be produced. The faster it turns, the more of these cycles will occur in one second. Ideally, if this coil is turned at a rate of 3600 RPM, it will generate 60 hertz, that is 60 of these cycles per second. That is the frequency of the AC voltage in our grid. So looking at the diagram, the potential between the terminals of your outlets at home is actually changing polarity and increasing and decreasing in voltage. They will have one fixed polarity that is one terminal will be the source and the other will be where it wants to go and it will become a maximum pressure or potential and then it will decrease to nothing then it will switch polarity that is the terminal that was the source now becomes where the electrons want to go and the other terminal becomes the source and it will increase in voltage or pressure and it will fall to zero and it does this cycle 60 times per second. If you've ever heard a transformer hum or a power adapter hum or even a humming on the speaker on a radio, you understand the 60 Hertz it is bleeding through the amplifier and into the speaker from the power supply. Modern electronic devices such as computers, televisions, radios, and even cell phone chargers cannot run on alternating current. Devices that can run on alternating current would include toasters, electric ovens, refrigerators, freezers, blow dryers, fans, and light bulbs. The current can pass through those devices in either direction so long as there is a potential Electronic components work by use of semiconductors and other devices, and they must have a DC source similar to a battery. So this is how a power supply works. You have the AC source, that could be the outlet. It hooks into a transformer. The transformer steps down voltage. It's still alternating current, but it's at a lower voltage. And then a rectifier changes it to DC. Four diodes are what make up this type of rectifier. A diode is a semiconductor device that allows current to flow through it in only one direction. The symbol's arrow points to a line, as you can see here. This is remembered as a roadblock. Current cannot flow through the diode in this direction. So even though it seems odd, current actually flows through it opposite the arrow. This way, into a roadblock, it goes this way. So remembering that the generator at the power plant provides an AC power source, the transformer just steps the voltage down to a safer voltage that the device requires. Think of voltage almost like pressure. So the transformer at one point in time, at one one hundred twentieth of a second, 
has a voltage source similar to this. It is climbing in voltage and it goes to a peak and then it begins to fall. But its polarity maintains. It's the same polarity for this entire duration. So we'll assume this is positive and this is negative for that alternation. So this is a source of electrons and this is where they want to go. So the electrons flow through the conductor cannot go this way because it's a roadblock. So they go this way. They can't go straight over to the positive because this diode is a roadblock. So it's forced to go through the component's negative terminal, power the component, then leave the component. It could go this way, but it can't go back at itself. It's not interested in going back to where it came from. It's interested in going to the positive. So it goes through this diode and back around. So the flow is continuous through the secondary coil here. It goes through this diode, through the component, and back around, just like this. That's, of course, ignoring its intensity, but that is its path for this alternation. Now we'll look at what happens with this negative alternation. the negative alternation, the magnetic field has changed in the transformer. The source is now a negative alternation. So the polarity has switched. This is now the source, and this is where they want to go. So the electrons flow this way. They can't go that way because it's a roadblock. They go through this diode, around, through the component, up this way, back around, it can't go, it doesn't want to go back at itself, that isn't how it goes through this diode, cannot go through that one, so it's forced to go this way, which is where it wants to get to. So again, it flows through here, around through this diode, to the negative of the device, flows through the device, powering it leaves here, which is basically a, a positive as far as the one. goes through this diode, back around through the transformer secondary. And again, this would be increasing in voltage, but we're ignoring that. We're just looking at the path for that negative alternation. So this is the positive alternation in its path current is going the same direction through the device, so the polarity is the same. And with the negative alternation of the AC waveform, it is still going through the device in the same direction. It's using two different diodes of this, what is called a full wave bridge rectifier, powering the device with the same polarity. These are often called power supplies, power adapters. If you've noticed some of the power supplies you may use for your gaming systems or maybe your multimedia speakers on your computer seem heavy, that's because the transformer has an iron core and that's what causes this mutual inductance and a decrease in voltage. So that iron core is heavy. As you may be thinking, well, the device does not need pulsing DC, as this is what the waveform would look like as on the device. It would pulse like this. It would just never change polarity. It would go up, go to no voltage. It would increase, go to no voltage. So it would never change polarity, but it would still be a pulsing DC. And the way to get rid of that would be to tie it in parallel with a capacitor. So the capacitor would try to maintain this peak voltage as it would store a charge temporarily. Those are called filter caps. There are many different designs for power supplies, but this is one example. Okay, so we understand how to change AC into DC, but how to change a plain DC source that is a source that has a constant polarity like a battery. The negative is always the source of the electrons and the positive is always where they want to go. We want to change that into alternating current. Well, we'll just have to look at the basic concepts of an inverter. 
the control circuit approximates the 60 Hertz AC. Here's the control circuit. and controls the separate switching circuits which are semiconductors maybe MOSFETs something like that and they're just solid state that is no mechanically moving parts but they electronically control the flow of electrons so we're just drawing them as regular switch symbols the TAN switches as you could call them allow the DC source current to pass through the transformers primary in one direction. So again looking at the tan switch when it's closed and the greens are open so when these close they're a path, solid electrical path and these are open that means no path. The DC source the negative will can't flow through here and go around because these, this is open and so is this one so it flows through here goes through the, the transformer primary in this direction and back to positive quickly after that the switches change positions that is the tans open up as they're shown in the diagram and the greens close and now electrical current is provided to the transformer in the opposite direction so the source is still a DC source but it's being fed by semiconductor switches into the transformer the control circuit interrupts the conduction of these solid state switches in a fashion that makes it switch the polarity connection to the primary. So after the voltage is stepped up or conditioned by the transformer you'll get a pulse with this being the negative and this being the positive and then you will get a pulse with this being the negative and the top being the positive. And that's approximating the sine wave. For a grid tied system, the control circuit sets its switching time equal to the grid frequency. So these would be inputs that may go over to the grid. This would be tied into the grid as well. And it would measure the grid frequency and would try to time and maintain the frequency exactly the same. You cannot have the alternating current coming out of here going to the grid and they're not synced up. That will cause extreme losses stress on both the inverter and the connection. An inverter is required if you have a DC generator storage batteries and you want to tie the system to the grid. If it's not necessary to tie it to the grid and it's acting on its own, no synchronization is required. It, it will just closely approximate 60 Hertz AC. storage. Batteries are often used in grid tied and standalone systems during higher demand when the generator is either not producing enough or winds are not sustained. Here we see the DC generator, a disconnect circuit, the feeder cables going to a utility building where it houses the inverter that has a a regulator circuit for the batteries and also a power inverter to feed into the grid and to the home. It's important to understand the difference between alternating current sources and DC sources. DC would come from a DC generator, a battery, a solar cell. So an AC generator is called an alternator from alternating current. It's an alternating current generator. Batteries require maintenance. Also capacitors and capacitance. Current, EMF, energy, frequency, generator, induction, inverter, Lin's law, the Leyden jar, 
permanent magnets, a rectifier, storage, that is electrical storage, and voltage. So this starts the second half of the semester. You should be through the reading. So to prepare for the Module 4 Lesson 1 quiz, complete the assignment. And the quiz needs to be completed by the end of this unit.